the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we hope that um, this is going to be a service where we honour God and glorify him. Um, I'm going to start with a call to worship, which is Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name for ever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name for ever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name for ever and ever. Well, let us come and praise his holy name, shall we? By singing our first hymn, which is before the throne of God above. Let our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the opportunity to meet here together as a body of your people to come and worship you. We pray that you would still our hearts and speak to us with a still, small but clear voice. We pray that our worship would be pleasing and acceptable to you. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit here and that we would meet together truly in your name. We come to praise you, Father. We come to extol you as the psalmist did. We praise you for your righteousness and your perfection. We praise you for the promises that you make and keep. We praise you for who you are, the great creator God and sustainer of the universe and saviour of your people. We thank you for the word that you've set before us, your holy and inerrant word of truth. And we pray that as we meet here, we would meet in spirit and in truth, that our worship would ascend as a sweet savour to you, and we pray for the work that goes on here in this place, your people here. Thank you for the body of people that you've raised up here at this Baptist Church. We pray that you would make us um, of one mind and of one heart, loving one another, that the world may know that you first loved us. We pray for the work of the gospel, that it would go out powerfully that in all of the things that go on throughout this week, your hand would be in it. If we're only doing things for ourselves, then they are nothing. We pray that you would be present in all of the things that we do and say, all of the work that goes on. We pray that your name would be the name high over all, exalted. Before the throne of God above we come. We come into your presence here this evening, Father. We come with awe and with reverence, acknowledging that you are holy, pure, and dwell in indescribable light. Yet we come with a confidence, because we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, 
your son, fully God, very God, fully man. We thank you for the finished and perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ that enables us to come into your presence and bring our worship to you. And so we pray that you would bless us, Father, as we, as we worship here tonight. We pray that you would give us a word of encouragement where we need it, a word of rebuke, a word of stimulation, that you would meet us where our needs are. You know our hearts. You know whether we're joyful or sorrowful. You know whether we're sick or well. And Father, you meet all of our needs with your glorious riches. We pray that tonight that you would meet with us, that you would touch us where you know we need to be touched, that you would move us and that we would not be hearers of the word only but doers, that we would grow together in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing again our second hymn. We're going to sing, Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. I'm going to read for us the passage that we'll be looking at very shortly, and that is Psalm 98. Um, Please feel free to turn to it with me if you wish. I'll read the whole psalm. (coughs) Sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Um, Let's uh, sing our third hymn, please, before we come to look at that passage. Let's stand to sing, Come and See. Commit our study to the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a Bible that we can read freely and openly and in a language we can understand. We thank you for the privilege of being able to read your true and holy word. And we pray that you would speak to us through your word tonight by the power of your spirit, that you would help us to understand what it is that you would have us know. We pray that the Bible would interpret itself, would you would show us what you mean through your word, and that you would give that word power to enter into our hearts, to pierce sharper than a two-edged sword, to go through the marrow and the bone right to the very heart of our need. You've come and you've met our need in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would help us see, help us Come and see and taste and see that we would know life and that life to the full that you come and bring. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. (coughs) Psalm 98 is a psalm of praise. That is not unusual. The psalms are full of praise. Uh, there is a huge section in the middle of this psalm shouting and making joyful noise to the Lord. What I want to look at is the reason that the psalmist wants us to rejoice, the reason why the psalmist wants us to praise from this psalm. There are two reasons given in the psalm, and they both 
um, precede or followed by the word for. The first is in verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. That is not surprising. We rightly praise God for doing marvellous things. We thank him for the things that he does. We praise him for the person that he is, rightly so. The second reason is in verse 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. That's a little more surprising, isn't it? When was the last time you praised God for the judgment to come? When was the last time you heard God praised for the coming judgment? That is a little surprising. And the purpose of this sermon is to explore together why it is that we are to praise God for his coming judgment and what the link is between the coming judgment and the marvellous things he has done. I'm going to explore that in three parts obviously, because I'm a Baptist. Um, The first two parts, I'm going to um, take a look at what this judgment is, because we can't know why it is we should praise God for his coming judgment unless we know what the judgment is. So I'm going to break that into two parts. The first part is the certainty of this judgment, and that we see in verse 9. The second part of verse 9 says, he will judge the world. We'll look at the rest of that part in more detail in a bit. But look at the word will. It can be translated shall as well. It is definite. It is certain. It's not a possibility. It's not a might or a maybe. It is a certainty. There is no escaping the judgment of God. You may recall Adam and Eve hid from God when they had disobeyed him. That was not effective. There is nowhere to hide from God. You can go to the bottom of the ocean. You can go into space. You can call on the mountains to fall on you. You cannot hide from God. His judgment is certain. And it's not just physically hiding from God. You cannot hide your thoughts. God sees our hearts. God knows our inmost being. We live in a world where people seem keen to share their inmost thoughts however foolish they might be. But even if you keep your thoughts in your heart, you cannot keep them from God. God sees everything. Um, Look then at the first part of verse 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes. So not just is this judgment certain, but God is coming. This is not passive. This is not God sat on a cloud somewhere in the sky. God is coming. God is coming to judge the earth. That is a powerful, positive image. He is active and he will seek us out. Now, I'm not taking this out of context of the Bible as a whole. This is not merely an Old Testament idea. Um, Let me give you this quote. For it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. That's Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. So certainty is seen in the New Testament as well as the Old. There will be a judgment. So what is this judgment? What does it involve? Uh, The answer to that question is the giving of an account. Giving of an account by us, each one of us, for our conduct, for our words, words we've spoken, for the thoughts in our minds, and for how we've managed our affairs. God has given us this life, we live it, and then we have to give an account of how we've lived it to God. And I'm using that phrase, give account deliberately, because that is a phrase that appears no fewer than six times in the New Testament in the context of the coming judgment. And I want to share one of those contexts with you, uh, because it will, I hope, illustrate what is going on in Psalm 98. If you have a Bible, if you wish to turn to it, it's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. Um, Jesus says this, But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So just looking at that for a moment before we turn back to Psalm 98, every careless word, well if we have to give account for every careless word, how much more will we have to give account for an angry word or a cruel word? 
And if we have to give account for our words, how much more will we have to give account for our actions? This judgment is a deep giving of account. It is everything. It is our entire lives that we have to give account for. The natural mind rebels against the idea of being judged. It's not uncommon when someone is criticised to say, how dare you judge me, or who are you to judge me? And actually there's some truth in that, isn't there? Judge not, lest ye be judged, Matthew 7, 1. Um, we, we are... We, we tend to rush to judgment as human beings. That is our propensity, um, and we should not. But that is not the judgment that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 12. And that's not the judgment that the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 98. That judgment is not a judgment of us one for another, a judgment of peers. This is a judgment of God. And the picture here that Jesus is painting in Matthew 12, is of a courtroom. That's the judgment. God is the judge. And look at the words he uses in verse 37. Acquittal and condemnation. That's the weighing in the balance that is going to um, go ahead. God is the judge. And he has not only power to judge, but he has authority to judge. He has created us. He's created this world, and he is entitled to require every person to give evidence, to witness, and to give an account of themselves, to explain what they've done. And it's black and white. There's acquittal, and there's condemnation. There's no adjournment to another occasion. There's no, we'll go and have a focus group. Um, there's no, we'll, we'll set up a royal commission. This is a judgment of acquittal and condemnation. And it's nerve-wracking to be judged. Few sane people want to appear before a judge, even here on earth, even in this country, where our judges have a good reputation and are honest and competent. No one wants to be weighed in the balance. No one wants to be found wanting. So the natural mind disputes the right of God to judge. But God does have the right to judge. And in Psalm 98, it says, he will judge the earth. So that's the certainty of judgment. But the second part of what is judgment is the seriousness of judgment. Let me give you three scriptures to illustrate the seriousness of judgment. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? 1 Samuel 6.20 but who can endure the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? Malachi 3.2. Why is it so serious? Why is God's judgment so serious? It's because it's eternal. It's not about what's going to happen in the next five minutes or hour or year or rest of our lives. It's what's going to happen forever and ever and ever. And it's black and white. Will we, will you, be with God forever? Will you be acquitted? Or will you be, will we be, cast into darkness, away from God forever? And let me, with uh, respect, give you a challenge. When you go home this evening, think to yourself, I invite you, when you face God's judgment... Are you going to be acquitted or are you going to be condemned? Now, let's help us answer that question because we need to know what the test is. If this is a courtroom and this is a judgment, we need to know by what standard God is going to judge us. Well, we can see that in Psalm 98 because the psalmist says it. Psalm 98 verse 9, he will judge the world in righteousness. I'll come to the last bit of that verse in due course. But he will judge the world in righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? What does, what does that mean? That means perfection. That means holiness. It is, not, it is not not doing wrong things. It's not not thinking bad things. It's not merely the absence of doing things wrong. It is something more than that. 
It is something uh, much more powerful than that. It is being right. It is being perfect. It is being holy. Now, it's not just me saying that. Let me show you um, how Jesus put it. Um, Matthew 5, 48. He said this. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect as God is perfect. Be as perfect as God. That's the test. That's the test for acquittal or condemnation. The law is full of tests. It loves drawing lines and categorising things and putting people into one pot and putting things to another pot. The test of eternal judgment is righteousness, its holiness and its perfection. We can also see that in Psalm 98 itself. If we look at um, verse 1, it refers to um, God's right hand and his holy arm. And you'll see righteousness in verse 2. And I want, to, I want us to look further at what verse 2 means in due course. But the test is righteousness. Who's perfect? Rightly, there is silence when I ask that question. There are lots of good people. I don't just mean in the church. I don't just mean in this church, in this building. You're all good people, I'm sure. Um, there are lots of good people. There are lots of very good people. There are people who give of their time and of their substance. There are people who give of their lives to help others. There are very good people, but there are no perfect people. No one in their right mind would say that they are as perfect as God is perfect, which is the standard that Jesus says is judgment. God demands perfection. In fact, the Bible has some pretty stinging things to say about us, even when we try and um, be righteous. Romans 3 says this, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God, all have turned away, they have together become worthless, There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So the Bible says there's no one righteous. No matter how good you are, you're not righteous. You're not as pure and holy as God. No one is. So then, how is it that in Psalm 98, we are to praise God for his judgment? If we are told judgment is certain, if we're told judgment is for eternity, and if we're told that the standard of judgment is righteousness and that we are all unrighteous, why are we praising God for his judgment? Surely the reaction is not shout for joy to the Lord. The reaction is woe is me, I am undone because I am not as righteous as I'm supposed to be. I am not holy as you are holy. I'm not perfect as you are perfect. That's the, that's the response, isn't it? So why is it, why is it that the psalmist is shouting for joy to the Lord for he comes to judge the earth? Well, that's what I want to explore in my final and third point. The key to this conundrum is in verse 9 and the last part of verse 9, where it says, He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. And it's the word equity that is the key to understanding what is going on here. What do you think of when you hear the word equity? It's a slightly unusual word. You might think of something to do with mortgages and how much you own in your property. Um, That, I promise you, is not what the psalmist is talking about um, when he says God is going to judge the people with equity. Well, we have to remember that the scene is a legal one. This is a judge. This is a courtroom scene. So we're looking for a legal concept. Well, equity does have a legal meaning. 
The word we use as equity comes from the Latin, aqueus, which means equal. The Hebrew word that's used here is meshor. It also means equal. And that gives us a start as to understanding what we're, get, what we're looking for here. Um, the same word is used in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3, and it's translated there as fairness. So again, that's giving us a, a start as to what's going on here. Um, the illustration of the concept is to be found in our own um, law in this country. Equity is a concept that involves the tempering of the harshness of the law. When a deserving person can't comply with the law's harsh demands, they come to the court of equity and they say to the judge, please be merciful. I cannot do what the law requires, but the justice of the case means that I seek your mercy. I don't come to you, judge, demanding my rights. I come to you pleading for mercy. And the link to the word mercy in this psalm is in verse 3. Verse 3, it says, He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our law, of our God. I'm reading from the NIV. In the NIV, love and faithfulness is the translation. Um, in the authorised version, it's um, mercy and truth. The word in Hebrew is kesed, which is rightly translated both as loving kindness and as merciful kindness. So the concept of mercy is where we move on from equity. We understand equity to mean mercy. It is not the rigours of the law. It is mercy. Well, how does God show us mercy? Mercy. Where is God's equity? How do, we, how do we see that working? If we can't satisfy the law's harsh demands, the answer is in verses 1 to 3. Let's look at those again. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. So, the answer is, it's something God has done. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. So that's telling us what is going on here. It is God who has worked salvation. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He's remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. To the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So it's God's salvation. Well, how has he revealed his righteousness? Look at the link between the two words. The test for judgment in verse 9 is righteousness. We've looked at that. It means holiness and perfection. But look in verse 2. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness. So how has he revealed his righteousness? So that we can praise God for his judgment. I'm going to take this in five steps. Step one for the revealing of righteousness. Jesus Christ is God. Full stop. Statement of fact. If that is not correct, then there is no way of escaping God's judgment. End of story. If Jesus Christ is not God, there's no salvation. There's no way of, there's no way of being righteous. Jesus Christ is God. Step two. Jesus is righteous and perfect. Because he is God, fully God, fully man. Righteousness and perfection are the tests for acquittal under the uh, law that we've just seen. That's what, that's what Jesus says. That's step two. Step three. Jesus has borne the condemnation... I use that word deliberately because that's his word. Jesus has borne the condemnation and punishment due under the law for unrighteousness and imperfection. He's borne that when he was crucified. That's step three. Step four. So God will not punish the unrighteousness and imperfection again, but rather will have mercy upon those who repent and trust in Jesus Christ. That's critical, so I'll say that again. God will not punish 
The unrighteousness and imperfection, again, because that would be unjust. Instead, he will have mercy upon those who repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Step five. By trusting in Jesus Christ, we become clothed in his righteousness and perfection when we stand before God to be judged. We saw that righteousness does not merely mean the absence of wrongdoing. It means some positive holiness. How do we get that? We get it by being clothed in Jesus Christ's holiness. We access that through his mercy when we repent and trust in him. So that's the five steps as to how um, the Lord has revealed his righteousness to the nations. But I just want to look in a little more detail at the concept of God's mercy. It's not something that one hears too much about. One hears a lot of God's love, rightly so, God keeping his promises, rightly so, um, but not quite so much about his mercy. So I want to look at um, God's merciful love. Um, Before I do that, I just wanted to draw a parallel Um, with what we read in Psalm 145, because I think that will help us. Um, In Psalm 145, I'll pick out a couple of verses that we read. Verse 7, they will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. God's righteousness. We sing of God's righteousness because we are clothed in that righteousness when we trust in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So again, we've got this concept of the Lord's righteousness, but then the Lord being near to those who call on him. Verse 19, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. So salvation comes from God. As the writer uh, Paul wrote into the Romans, we can't save ourselves by by fulfilling the law, but Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. And verse 13 of Psalm 145, the Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The translation of verses 8 and 9 in the authorised version says this, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. And the concept of mercy uh, is critical in relation to this. We cannot fulfil the law's harsh demands, so we require God's mercy. We require his gift of his own righteousness to which we have no right. You cannot go in front of God and say, I demand that. That doesn't work. You can only go in uh, before God and plead with him for his mercy. Um, the second um, verse that I'll just read in relation to uh, mercy is, is Exodus 34, verse 6. It says this, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That verse links those three um, concepts of grace, mercy and forgiveness. God is gracious when he shows mercy to us and forgives our sin. And he only forgives our sin because it has already been punished in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the the critical fact about mercy. There are two other quotations that I'd like to use as illustrations of this concept of mercy. These quotations don't come from the Bible, but nevertheless, I think they're helpful illustrations. The first 
is short, the second a little longer. The, the first comes from a book I read last year, and this declaration starts off, if not every chapter, then almost every chapter, and it says this. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. In the name of God, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. Not a bad way to start a chapter of a book. Um, but that concept of giving mercy, I think, is, is helpful. If we um, look back in our Psalm 98, I said at the beginning, when I was talking about the certainty of judgment, that in verse 9 it says, he comes to judge the earth. So, verb, action, God is coming to judge. God is giving mercy. We tend to say, one has mercy. But this is a more active concept. This is not merely the passive possession of mercy. This is a giving of mercy. This is coming to give mercy. This is positively coming to you to give you mercy, to provide mercy to you, uh, which I think is, is a helpful illustration of what is being said in Psalm 98. Um, the, the second quotation um, is a little longer, um, and it is this. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch much better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptred sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. So let me just complete that thought. How do we, practically, how do we access God's mercy? I think I've said it already, but it's worth saying again. Repentance and faith. We must acknowledge that we are unrighteous. We must acknowledge that we are not perfect. And we must acknowledge that we cannot stand in the day of God's judgment in our own filthy rags. We must trust that the Lord Jesus Christ has died for us. We must ask him to forgive us our sin and we must rely upon his righteousness to be our clothing. That's how, that's what, that's the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what one must do to be saved. So, I'm going to conclude with the same question that I invited you to consider when you go home this evening, which is when you stand, and you will stand, before the bar of God and you face his judgment and you have to give an account of your life, your words, your thoughts and your deeds, Will you be acquitted or will you be condemned? Let me tell you this, and this is not me telling you, this is the Bible and this is God telling you. Unless you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be condemned. If you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be acquitted. Very often, one awaits the outcome of a judgment with uncertainty. One knows that the evidence has gone well or badly, the witnesses have come across well or badly, the legal arguments are clever or not clever, and one doesn't really know what the answer is going to be. Not so with God's judgment. Not so at all. We can know for a certainty whether we will be acquitted or whether we will be condemned. And remember, those, are, those words are not mine. Those are Jesus' words. If you plead with God for mercy, if you ask God to season justice with mercy if you rely on the righteousness of Jesus Christ 
He will be merciful. He's promised he will. And as we read in that psalm, he keeps his promises. Absolutely. He will be merciful and he will make you righteous. You will have the righteousness of God. You will have the righteousness of Jesus Christ because he was punished for your sin. Then what will happen is you'll rejoice with the psalmist because you will rejoice in the judgment that sets you free and that acquits you. And when you know that you are trusting in Christ, when you know you will be acquitted, this is what will happen. You will say, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. If you're going to be acquitted, praise God and rejoice. Amen. Um, let's sing our final uh, hymn, which is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon and stars in their courses our service with prayer our father in heaven we thank you for your mercy we praise you for your mercy we confess that there is none righteous no one we confess that our greatest righteousness is as filthy rags and yet we have a savior who is perfect and holy and righteous and Father, we praise you for that beautiful plan of salvation that you have crafted. A salvation that only you could work. A 
a salvation that only you could create. And we pray that um, we would rejoice in that message, that profound message of eternal acquittal that is to be found in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the joy that you have set before us, knowing that we are free, knowing that we are free indeed when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you came to bring life and life to the full. Thank you, our Father. Amen. Amen.